he stole Christmas. We've seen that there's a lot of things that can steal Christmas away from us. It might be fear. Fear can steal Christmas. If you're so scared, you can't experience that Christmas joy, what do you do? Well, you see whose plan it is, you see whose promises they are, and you see whose you are. Talked about that two weeks ago. Last week we saw that pride can steal Christmas, that if, if you have to be the best, if you have to have a perfect Christmas, you're gonna be so high strong, you're not gonna be able to experience joy. But what do you do? You see how small you are, you see whose you are, and you see how holy you are. Now, those two things, I imagine you go, oh yeah, fear can steal Christmas, I get that. Uh, pride can steal Christmas, I get that. Th those are generally negative things, especially if you think about sinful pride. But today we're going to talk about something a little bit different. Happiness stole Christmas. Except I thought you're supposed to be happy at Christmas, right? It's the most wonderful time of the year! If you watch Hallmark movies and you are and you are angry about Christmas, you will find a fiancé really quickly that will teach you the true meaning of Christmas. <laughs> I think maybe I need to rephrase this a little bit, though. See, I actually want you to be happy at Christmas. I would love it if December 24th, December 25th, you celebrate and you are happy. I do want that. So let me change this a little bit. Chasing happiness stole Christmas. If you are insisting that everyone at your Christmas party be happy, you're probably going to have a bad time. I think of an episode of Friends. It was a Thanksgiving episode, but we'll go with it. Monica wants to make a great meal for all her friends, and all of them want different types of potatoes. You've got to have chunky potatoes. You have to have mashed potatoes. You have to, I forget what they all are. Um, and she ends up having a terrible time because she's making all these things and no one's happy. And ah! If you're chasing happiness, you're actually probably going to end up having a pretty bad Christmas. So what do you do? Find your goal. Your goal isn't happiness. Your goal is holiness. Let's dig into this. We're going to go to the first chapter of the book of John. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. So we talked a little bit about John the Baptist last week. We're continuing that today. Yeah, I'm going to be referring a lot to last week. There's a series where there's a lot of building. So if you missed last week, up on our YouTube, on our Facebook. It's all posted there. You'll be able to watch just the sermon. You can watch the whole service, too, if you want. But they're also just the sermon as well. John came, and he had a purpose. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. Now, you can read the first chapter of John on your own. You can go home and do that. I'm not trying to hide something from you. Uh, that light is Jesus. That's what we're talking about here. John's entire purpose, his goal was to say, look at that! Look! Now, he started his ministry before Jesus started his ministry. So John was pointing ahead saying, someone is coming! He preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He said, look, you are not as big as you think you are. See how small you are. You need someone to come rescue you. And he's coming! If his goal was to be happy, he did a really bad job of it. He, he was pointing away from himself. In fact, later on, once Jesus started his ministry, John had all these followers, and they started jumping ship and joining Jesus. And some of John's followers came and said, um, dude, you've got to do something about this. And John said, I must decrease, he must increase. That doesn't sound like a happy thing to me. As his ministry went on, he was so devoted to this, to pointing toward Jesus, that he ended up getting arrested, thrown in jail, and executed. Even before then, he wore scratchy clothes. It was not the best <coughs> clothes. And his diet was honey. Okay, I'm behind that. Got a bit sweetener. And locusts. I'm not much on the old bug diet. My guess is that if he was aiming for happiness, he did not do a good job. But he had a goal. His goal was sharing Jesus, pointing people toward Jesus. And 
because that was his goal, his life reflected that. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Jump forward a few verses. Again, read this on your own. Make sure that I'm not trying to bamboozle you or anything. That's right, bamboozle. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent <coughs> priests and Levites out to ask who he was. He didn't fail to confess, but confessed freely, I'm not the Christ. He could have gone away with it if he wanted. He could have said, I'm the guy you've been waiting for. He could have been rich. But he didn't. He said, I'm not the guy. They asked him then, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. Who did, what do you say about yourself? So these teachers, all these people that really knew the Bible well, they start going, okay, so if you're not, if you're not the Christ, if you're not the promised one, well, mm. there's this guy that was supposed to show up named Elijah. Several hundred years before, there was a prophet named Elijah who had done a lot of miracles. He was taken directly up to heaven. And then 400 years before Jesus was born, God sent a prophecy we're actually going to look at in a little bit, where God said, before the Savior comes, I'm going to send Elijah. We find out later on, Jesus says, oh, that's John the Baptist. But what happened in the time between, there's this, all this mythology that was built up around God's promise. So God really did promise, I'm sending this, this person like Elijah, I'm going to talk. And people heard that and they went, oh, so he's going to show up and he's going to, uh, he's going to kill all the bad guys like Elijah did. He's going to do all this. And so John's like, I, I'm not going to mess with that. That's what you think? I'm just going to say that's not me. I'm not Elijah. Or are you the prophet then? 1500 BC, God sends another prophecy. He says, there's going to be a prophet that shows up like Moses. Listen to him. We found out later on, that's Jesus. It's another prophecy about Messiah. And the Jews back then didn't get it because some prophecies are kind of hard to read. They went, well, there's going to be the Christ and there's going to be the prophets, two different people. Well, John goes, well, I'm not that guy either. And the people go, what? Well, what are you doing here? Who are you? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I'm the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. We looked at that last week. Check out last week's sermon. Now, some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you're not the Christ, or Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you don't know. He's the one who comes after me. The thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptized. John had a goal. His goal was to share Jesus. And he lived out that goal. Wouldn't that be really cool if God gave you a goal? If he showed up and said, this is what you're supposed to do. Today, after church, I want you to go to Costco, and I want you to get a rotisserie chicken, and then you're going to go to the interstate, and you're going to give that rotisserie chicken to one of the people that's asking for money there. That's your goal. And you can go, okay, I can do this. Sure. Go to Costco. Maybe you don't have a membership, so you bribe someone who's got a membership to bring you a rotisserie chicken. I don't know. It'd be really simple, right? God gave you a goal. One of the very last things Jesus said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Your goal is the same as John's. This is God. This is, this is who you need. This is who I need. Uh, those of you who took part in our How to Witness, How to Share Jesus workshops uh, a couple months ago at this point, saw that one of the great ways to do that is start by saying, I need Jesus, and then go to, and so do you. Start with what Jesus has done for you. I am a sinner. I know the evil I've done, and Jesus saved me. And he saved you too. Now, if your goal is happiness, you're probably not going to do this a whole lot. Because let's confess, sharing Jesus, often enough, is awkward. And can lead to people being angry. And can lead to all sorts of problems. If your goal is happiness, you might not do this a whole lot. You might not do it at all. Which means God gave you a goal, and you're saying, no, no, I've got a different goal. Chasing happiness means that you're saying no to God's goal very often. 
No, no, I, I, I want to do something else. So find your goal. Instead of chasing happiness, figure out what the goal is. Your goal is not happiness. We're going to go to the book of Malachi. It is not pronounced Malachi. I actually like pronouncing it that way because it drives people up a wall. It's Malachi. And it is the last book written in the Old Testament. It was written about 400 B.C. We're going to go over the entire last chapter. Don't worry, it's a short one. There's only six verses. And it starts off really dark. Surely the day is coming. They'll burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day that's coming will set them on fire, says Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. Pride stole Christmas. It's that word arrogant there, obviously very closely linked. And maybe you read this and you go, yes! It's kind of like uh, at the end of a movie that's got a really good villain, and the villain finally loses, and they get punished, and he goes, yes! Ursula has stolen Ariel's voice, and she's stolen the prince, and she's going to rule the waves and be evil, and then she gets poked by a boat and explodes, and yay! And you look at that and go, yay, all the evildoers, they're going to be punished! Yes! Until you look in a mirror. See, God is the one who gets to decide what is good and what is evil. And he said it very bluntly. When you chase happiness, you're chasing something that delights you. And we all have these sinful natures. And the sinful nature delights in evil. What I'm going to do fairly quickly is I'm going to walk through the Ten Commandments. And what I want you to do is to be honest with yourself and ask, do I delight in some of these things that God says is evil? Do I delight in what God says is good? We're going to do go backwards. Ninth and tenth commandments, both based on the same one, says you shall not covet. Coveting means wanting something that God has said, this is not yours to have. Maybe you covet someone else's family. I wish I had their family life. Their family is so much better. It's because they've got that great husband. It's got that, got, they got that great wife. Oh, their kids are so much better than mine. God's given you your family. He says, no, that, that's their family. That's for them. Maybe it's a body. You look at uh, stuff on TikTok and all, all these people that look so much better than you are, and you go, oh, I want what they have. Maybe it's money. Lifestyles of the rich and famous. I know it's not on anymore. Um, there is a French chateau over on um, Turkey Foot Road that every time I drive past, I go, oh, man. I wish I could live there. I don't have $2 million. I can't afford it. It was actually for sale until this last week. Is that you? Do you look at what other people have and go, I wish I had that? God says, that's not for you. Wanting what someone else has, wanting what God has said no to, that's evil. Eighth commandment. You shall not lie. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And it's not just about lying. God says to speak well of your neighbor. Take every word and action in the kindest possible way. Which means if it's bad, even if it's true, you just say, I'm not going to talk about that. Do you delight in gossiping, though? Do you delight in, yeah, this thing really happened, how oh, it's going to destroy them? Do you delight in evil? Seventh commandment, you shall not steal. Not just stealing, but actually taking what belongs to someone else. You're paid so much an hour to work your job. When you don't work, you're stealing from your boss. God says to help your neighbor improve his property. You like doing that? Sixth commandment. You shall not commit adultery. Do you delight only in the body of your spouse if you happen to be married? And if you're not married, do you delight in the bodies of others? Do you keep it to just your spouse if you're married? Or do you look at other bodies and go, oh, yeah. Fifth commandment, you shall not murder. Not just murdering, but also using violence against others. Violent words, hate. Or diss tracks, your favorite thing you create. Fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. Every teenager.
teenager's favorite, favorite commandment and every parent's favorite commandment. Have you always delighted in honoring your father and mother? How about others in authority? How about your boss? How about the government? No matter who's in charge of the government at that point, do you delight in honoring them even if you have to say no to obeying what they demand? Do you still honor them even when you say no? Always. Always. I don't know if I trust you. <laughs> it is true. We all have different commandments that... So may, maybe you're okay with that one and some other ones that you, that you struggle with. Third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Do you delight in being in God's word? Or do you find anything else much more? Do you delight in sharing God's word? Especially maybe with kids? Second commandment. You should not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Using God's name only to pray, praise, and give thanks. Calling him on the day of trouble. Or to use God's name as a filler. Oh my God. First commandment. You shall have no other gods. Do you love, fear, love, and trust in God above all things? The simple truth is that if I take what God says seriously, this is me. Because I chase happiness. I chase these things that God says are wrong. And let's be honest, even if I'm not doing that, even if the thing I'm chasing isn't necessarily wrong in itself, is it keeping me from chasing something that God says is good? Or if someone gets in the way between me and my happiness, do I get angry at them and send at them? Y'all know I'm a geek. I like Star Trek. I'll watch an episode. You call me in the middle of that, you need help. If I turn off the phone, what am I valuing? more, you or Star Trek. Ain't nothing wrong with enjoying Star Trek. But I should be listening to you. See, this is what chasing happiness does. If my goal is happiness, even if what causes me to be happy isn't sinful in and of itself, I'll end up sinning on the way to get there. And God is very blunt about what happens. But the next verse shows something very, very different. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you'll go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Then you'll trample down the wicked. There'll be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. He says, this is different when you revere his name. When you, when you go, God is so good. What happens is God looks at you and he says, I know your sin. I know what you delight in. But you know what I delight in? For the joy set before him, Christ Jesus endured the cross, scorning and shame. For the joy of having you in his family. For the joy of washing you clean. God says, I make you my own. And our reaction to that is revering his name. Go, wow, God is so good. And as a result of that, we have freedom. That calf goes out and dances in the meadow. It's locked up. It's trying to get free. And then there's freedom. You're locked up in your sin, and God says, I set you free. The sins do not lock you up anymore. You are not a slave to sin anymore. And the reaction to that is joy. But not because you're chasing after happiness, but because God chased after you. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I'll send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. There's that prophecy we've mentioned before. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of their children to their fathers. Or else I'll come and strike the land with a curse. We're actually going to hear that verse again next week. And we're going to see that that verse is very much about John the Baptist. He knew the goal. The goal wasn't to make people happy. It wasn't the goal to make him happy. The goal was to point people to Jesus. To release them. To set them free. And the happiness would be a side effect of that. This is what often happens in Christianity. C.S. Lewis, really smart guy. Um, this is not inspired by God. But he said some stuff that was really smart. He said, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of pork would do that. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. He was right. What do we start our service with? We confess our sins. Does that ever make you happy? 
Dude, you know how I messed up this week? You know the evil I did? Oh boy, that makes me happy to say that, right? But then you hear that announcement of forgiveness. And now you're at peace. It's the goal is happiness. You're never going to come. You're not going to confess your sin. You're going to go back to that bottle of pork or whatever it is. But the goal is holiness. And there's something different that happens. Chasing happiness stole Christmas. Find your goal. Your goal isn't happiness. Your goal is holiness. So we're going to go to the New Testament now. We're going to see Paul wrapping up the book of 1 Thessalonians. Oh, great. I've gapped it out. Is that the 1st or 2nd Thessalonians? The, the, tech, the, the reference will be up here in just a minute. Be joyful always. Wait a second. I just said don't chase happiness. And then he says be joyful always. How does this work out? Happiness and joy are not the same thing. Happiness is your reaction to circumstances. I had a good day. I'm happy. She said she loves me. I'm happy. Oh, man. Have you had this ravioli? That makes me happy. I just got Super Mario Brothers Wonder. That makes me happy. These are circumstances. And you know what? If they make you happy, that is not a bad thing. Someone says they love you and you're happy about that? Praise God for that blessing, right? You've got Super Mario Brothers Wonder? Awesome. Enjoy it. Th that's fine. But understand that that happiness is based on your circumstances, and circumstances change. She broke up with me. I'm not happy anymore. I had a bad day. I'm not happy anymore. I didn't get the Christmas gift I wanted. I'm not happy anymore. The ravioli was from Chef Boyardee, and you know, that did not make me happy. <laughs> Circumstances change. Joy is based on reality. Jesus was born for me. He lived the perfect life I never did. He died for me, giving me his record. He lives again. No matter what I am feeling at that moment, this is true and does not change. You can have joy and not be happy. You can have Jesus and cling to him and say, this is real. Even when I have a bad day, Jesus died for me, and I have a home in heaven. Even if I don't have Super Mario Brothers Wonder, I have heaven waiting for me. That is so much better. Even when she breaks up with me, God has adopted me as his child. He will not abandon me. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. So if you can have happiness, oh, that's not a bad thing necessarily. But you'll never lose joy as long as you've got Jesus. Chase Jesus and you will always have joy, whether or not you're happy. So be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, whether you're happy or not. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't put up a spirit's fire. Don't treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. First Thessalonians, aha. May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. So a big church word there says, may, the God, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you. Sanctify is a big church word. It means to make holy. See, Jesus' goal when he came to earth was not to make you happy. If his goal was to make you happy, he could have given you a lot of stuff. He could have shown up in a Santa Claus outfit and given you everything on your list and that would make you happy for at least a little bit, right? But that wasn't his goal. Jesus' goal was to make you holy. His goal was to come to earth and live the life that we fail. All those ten commandments I went through, he kept all ten of them. He never coveted. He always took every word and action in the kindest possible way. He helped others improve what they had. He never treated someone else's body as it was his to take. He always, always took care of those around him, even healing. He honored his father and mother, even though he knew more than them, because he was God. He always honored the Sabbath day. He never took his father's name in vain. He never had any other gods. And when Jesus died on the cross, he gave you his record. He took your sins away. And he says, now you have my record. He looks at you and you're holy now. You're a saint. That's his goal. 
He has sanctified you. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless. You can't be kept blameless if you're not blameless to start with, right? Now that you've been made holy, God says, no, I, I want to keep you that way. The one who calls you is faithful. And he'll do it. This is amazing. And this is the cool thing, is that when you've got this, you may not always be happy, but you always have joy. Instead of chasing after the things that are temporary, you're chasing after things that will never go away. Heaven forever. That's a lot better, and you're going to be happy a lot longer than Super Mario Brothers Wonder will make you. You'll be a lot more happy than that relationship will make you. Even the good things of this earth, the wonderful things. You go out and you take a walk through a, through a national park, and you see all that wonder, and you say, wow, this makes me happy. God says, good, I made that creation for you. But the new creation, heaven, is going to blow that away. Chase after the things that last. And Christmas can't be stolen from you. If Christmas is about happiness, you can never guarantee that you'll have Christmas. But if Christmas is about joy, it's about Jesus, it doesn't matter what else happens. You're going to have a great Christmas because you're going to have your goal. My goal is Jesus. Jesus came to you. You've got it. No one can steal him from you. So let me encourage you. Don't chase happiness this Christmas. Know your goal. Goal isn't happiness. Your goal is holiness. And God has made you holy. Amen. Let's stand. Now, the peace of God that is better than anything we can understand will keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until he returns to bring us home to life everlasting. Amen. Now, we gather an offering to support our ministry here. There's a plate in the back if you'd like to make use of that. If you prefer to give it electronic.